Hi, I'm Beck, and we're really excited to share with you this specially edited excerpt from the documentary Solstice. And before you watch it, we wanted to give you a short introduction to the film and explain why we think it is relevant to the rural city of Wangaratta. The film tells the story of the winter solstice, an Aubrey event for people affected by mental health issues and for survivors of suicide. It was founded by a family who lost their 15-year-old daughter to suicide, and they form the centre of the film's story. Since the first event in 2013, the winter solstice has helped to change how the Aubrey community understands, talks about, and responds to mental health and to survivors of suicide. We know that the rural city of Wangaratta has been greatly affected by mental health issues, including suicide. We also know this community has some great ideas to help create long-term positive change. The winter solstice is just one example of how communities can unite together, build strength and create greater connections. And we are proud to add it to the mix of ideas as we find our own community-driven solutions with the help of the Grit and Resilience Program. So with that in mind, we are excited to firstly share this edited documentary and then at 6 p.m. on the 21st of June, have you join us and thousands of others from across Australia and around the world for this year's virtual Winter Solstice, which will be live streamed on the Winter Solstice Facebook page. When Mary was very young, she was an incredibly independent baby. Once she started to walk, we would all head to the swimming pool. She would arrive at the pool and strip off and just jump in and roll around. She had no fear, really. To me, she was just a, a normal little girl. She was loving and wonderful, our only daughter, the youngest. Um, I think we all had a soft spot for her. Oh, that's a great shot. Mm. Yes. I think we've hit the jackpot here with these ones. Yeah, I haven't looked at these for years and years. I love that one. That's <laughs> what she was like when she was, before she got sick. Mary was seven years younger than me. My earliest memories of her, uh, she was a very fun, chubby little kid who liked to, you know, play with Henry and myself. It was a pretty cool world growing up. We were all pretty close, I guess. Um, we'd spend most of our time, school holidays, weekends, down in these paddocks, like exploring, and <laughs> it was it, what felt like another world that you could, yeah, kind of escape to. Mary loved to do well at school. She was good at most of her pursuits, whether that was cross country running and swimming. I remember she used to play water polo always seriously and liked to do well. She loved horses, that was probably her main passion. I think we probably had a really idyllic family life until really when she got sick and that was in her first year of high school. Mary came home from school one day and had a sore mouth and the following day we saw a dentist um, suggested that she have a root canal filling done in Melbourne and coming out of the dentist in Melbourne it was like a switch. She went from eating to you know pretty well no recognition that food was something that was needed and it was pretty scary. She ended up in the Aubrey Hospital for a week on a gastro um, tube and she was sent to Royal Children's where she spent two months. You know, having a child that started with a physical illness, lost a lot of weight, developed an eating disorder, eight weeks in 
hospital in Melbourne, the family just, the whole, everything goes pear-shaped. I was back at home working in the, the family business. I was also the mayor at the time, so I was doing the mayoral duties. Annette went to the hospital with Mary and Henry and myself every weekend. We got down to see Annette and Mary and it was just really tough seeing her in an environment in the eating disordered ward. They probably knew it was a mental illness, but the the wisdom of the day was you refed the person so they were well enough to recover and they hoped the mental side would continue after that. When Mary was um, let out of hospital, we had to provi provide breakfast, the same as what she was having in the hospital and she had to eat in front of all of us. It was terrible, but we still had to go to these horrible appointments. <laughs> so we travelled every Tuesday, down and back in one day, five of us in the car, four, you know, eight hours. For the next three years, she didn't ever pick up any food by herself and eat it. We just had to be with her every time. So every day, Annette or myself went to school at morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea, which must have been exceptionally demeaning to have to walk across the playground with other kids knowing what was going on, I guess. And she'd come and sit with us, ate what we had for her, and that was the pattern. She just couldn't do it by herself. But we, yeah, we didn't know we were actually treating a mental illness per se, just an eating disorder. And the conventional wisdom was that you had just had to keep feeding, but we didn't seem to ever get to the core of the problem. Apart from when Mary was eating, um, which was obviously a, a difficult small periods in the day, everything was as normal as, as it could be, I think. Yeah. Just making sure that she was able to do everything that she loved and, and wanted. She had played a, a game of water polo on Sunday and, and playing A-grade women's water polo for Aubrey and that had a, a spectacular win. So that was on Sunday and I think she would have been just on a huge high. And I think the next day was, was normal but, you know, she was a bit tired and Annette had said, um, Mayor, you better have tomorrow off, which is Tuesday. I woke up about 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning and I didn't go straight back to sleep and I saw Mary's light come on and off just for a second or two seconds and I didn't think anything more about that. I left pretty early and went to the, the sales meeting and Lloyd, man that prepares the cars, said there'd been a suicide up on the freeway. And it was at that moment that something dawned on me and I, I walked straight out of the office, um, rang Annette on my phone and said, see if Mary's there. And she walked to Mary's room and she wasn't there. Marg Moran, who's a, a local detective, she yeah, turned up at the house and that's yeah, when it was confirmed that I guess worst had happened. The day that we found out Mary had died, and it's like, it's a whirlwind. You sort of just go minute to minute, feeling of that really unbearable grief. I think it is all the what ifs, you know. How could we have saved her? I was still functioning at a certain level after she died and I, I thought about the funeral a lot. Do you, you know, do you have a private ceremony and and shut up shop or or do we just put it out there and let everyone know pretty well this is what's happened. We all went down to the river before it, that's Annette, myself, Jack and Henry and pretty well said here, here we go, we've got to do this and do the best we can and 
So we went to QE2. We were so involved with it and just our grief that you just had to, to go through the process. I have approached today trying to make sure we do justice to our memories of Mary. Parts of it were quite lovely and I think Mary would have been happy with her send off. It honoured her and you know, I was pretty well determined to try and make sure that we, we showed her the dignity she deserved. You're numb and heartbroken and just wound up with grief that it consumes your day. Having experienced a number of deaths in our family, I just know that there was something about suicide. It, it was different. It's not something everyone can cope with, but everyone is in some way connected with a mental health story. I think the talking and the openness is the only way to go on that. After Mary died, um, about six months after she died, I said to Stuart, I think I would like to do an event. I guess I wanted an event for survivors of suicide. I couldn't at that particular stage even write an email, so Stuart was writing invitation emails, you know, from his Baker Motors um, email address. And yeah, so from there we just gradually formed a committee. Musicians regarding the stage requirements? I've heard back from one of them. That first year, even putting up posters in shops along Dean Street and at other businesses was daunting and not every shop would take it when they read the word suicide. So it, it was scary. I used to have dreams, nightmares, that I was the only one there under an umbrella. And yeah, I still have those <laughs> dreams. I think you need to have experienced the suicide or the mental illness uh, to drive yourself to do an event. Thank you. How friggin' cold is it? Hi, Hen. Hello, how are you? Good. I uh, will be heading off early this afternoon. Okay, good. I might not see you before, say good luck, but good luck. Thank you. I often say that Mary has made me brave. <laughs> Her words about mental health being misunderstood probably is the thing that has kept us working on the winter solstice and just trying to help anyone that needs help. Every time I see her net, uh, I think of the way that she's really, I always say, she's the most dangerous person in Aubrey. <laughs> she hits me when I say that. <laughs> but, but she is, I mean that in a great sense. Yeah. Yeah. We are connected. That is the purpose of Winter Solstice and that is why we are here tonight. My name's Joe Williams. I'm extremely thankful and lucky to be alive to share my story here with you tonight in Albury, a place very special to my heart. Many, many of you here tonight have been touched by suicide. We need to talk and we need to listen. Kindness, compassion, understanding and love will have the last word. 
It's the beauty of connection. When we have connection, we show empathy. When we have empathy, it's when we're able to show that, show that pain or show that emotion. You know, so that's, that's where we need to get to as a community, as a society. Come to me, my brother, and I will sit with you a while. Pretty soon I'll see you smile and you know you will. No matter how much you're hurting right now, you know that everything will change in time. Oh, I just might see you in another light. Got no dog here in the fight I can carry your burden, brother mine